Now, our first guest has been called the godfather of Silicon Valley. He's been an active angel investor for over 15 years and was an early investor in companies from Google to Twitter and PayPal. Ron Conway of SV Angel joins us straight from TechCrunch Disrupt. Ron, welcome to Bloomberg West. Great to have you on the show today. Thank you. Now, I want to start uh, with this news surrounding Michael Arrington. I know that you guys are close. Uh, to you as an investor who focuses on startup, what is TechCrunch without Michael Arrington? Well, TechCrunch without Michael Arrington, I hope it does well, but uh, it's a safer bet with Michael Arrington. And I think it's unfortunate that, uh, that Ariana Huffington had more to say about it than she probably should have. So how big a blow do you think then this is for AOL, which now owns TechCrunch? Well, it's all about retention of the existing great writers at TechCrunch. You know, Mike Arrington uh, was the the brand and the and the figurehead behind TechCrunch. But keep in mind, Michael Arrington and Heather Hardy put together a phenomenal team. It's all about now keeping that phenomenal team of uh, of journalists. Uh, in place at TechCrunch. That's that's the uh, the key mission now. If I was Ariana, do you think there's a risk of TechCrunch losing some of the other top writers there, like MG Siegler and Paul Carr, who've been very vocal in this whole kind of escapade about you know their disappointment that that Arrington is no longer with the company? Well, that's something that uh, that the manage that the management of TechCrunch has to deal with now, and I hope they're successful because Paul Carr and M.G. Siegler are great examples of of great writers who contribute a lot to the Silicon Valley ecosystem. Now you're an investor in the Crunch Fund. There's this, been this whole debate about the journalism ethics surrounding this. Do you think that that gives you an advantage in terms of coverage by TechCrunch because you are close with Michael Arrington? Uh, no, because uh, Michael Arrington, you know, is a very independent person. Uh, he's always disclosed any conflict and. The uh, the team at TechCrunch has also always done that as well. Some of the companies Michael Arrington has been the most harsh to, FYI, are companies that he's investors in or with entrepreneurs that he's friends with. Uh, f funny enough, uh, he's actually pretty even-handed with his criticism. Now, Ron. You, you've got a new fund now. You were early in Twitter, Google, PayPal. What direction are you taking your new fund in? What kinds of companies are you most interested in backing? Well, we are still investing against a theme of real-time data, and that encompasses any market segment where consumers are contributing to the corpus of content on the web. And it's a multi-billion dollar opportunity uh, in each of these segments that we look at. Um, social media, you know, starting with Facebook, that massive, valuable corpus of content is all uh, consumer contributed. There's a new space that we call collaborative consumption now where consumers create a marketplace together. The most vivid example of that would be Airbnb, where it's a community of people who open up their homes uh, to consumers who are looking for temporary housing. Uh, it's an ingenious idea. It's growing like a weed. And we think this whole uh, concept of collaborative consumption is a multi-billion dollar brand new market uh, just being harvested by by startups in technology. Now, Ron, uh, Ben Horowitz, the venture capitalist, wrote a very flattering post about you last year saying, speaking as an entrepreneur, if I were to start a firm today and could have only one investor, it would be 
Ron Conway. You, you practically invented angel investing, Ron. What exactly do you bring companies in terms of uh, advice and networking opportunities that they wouldn't get at a traditional venture capital firm? Well, we just get involved at inflection points, and that starts all the way with the day we invest. We try and help the entrepreneur build the best syndicate of co-investors who invest with us, all of whom add value. Uh, then once we invest, we help build the management team and recruit engineers and recruit you know, the key hires it takes to build a startup. Uh, then once the product is built, we help the company get distribution for the product. Then it's all about eyeballs and users, and we use our Rolodex in technology to uh, get millions of users to become aware of, of these new websites. Um, and your Rolodex and, and your network, your Rolodex and your network, Ron, obviously come highly recommended within the Valley. I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the other angel investors out there. You wrote an email last year that ended up on TechCrunch in which you said, I wish the angel community could have the same integrity and values of the entrepreneur community, but unfortunately, I now believe that is hopeless and your actions prove that. What kinds of concerns do you have about other inv angel investors who may or may not have the right motives? Well, there, there were some specific disagreements a year ago, and I think the angel investing community learned a lot from that experience. And I think all the angel investors today are, are better for that since uh, the, the criticism that we were leveling on each other I think was actually helpful in pointing out what we do think uh, adds value to companies and what the focus should be. Uh, and I think a lot of angel investors today have learned from that and I think the tech community is better off for it. We're talking with Ron Conway, who has revolutionized the angel investing world, getting in early with the likes of Google and PayPal. But in addition to being a super angel, he also runs a Twitter investment fund called RC Chirp. It collects shares from Twitter employees looking to cash out and helps prevent those shares from being sold on the secondary markets and tripping that 500 shareholder SEC rule that would require Twitter to disclose its financials. Ron, first of all, tell us how exactly does this Twitter fund work and how competitive is it to get these shares? Well, the, the fund that I started um, has, has run its course, so to speak. Um, and so that all happened six months ago and we raised the fund and it's kind of mission accomplished. Uh, let me jump in, Ron. So uh, uh, I'm really interested in, in the ways you stick with some companies over a long term, because you really are there at, at this stage, at this garage band kind of two guys in a PowerPoint presentation stage. Are you always involved in your companies as they go through many rounds and many years of, of investing and, and building and inventing? Uh, our specialty is helping the companies in the early days. And uh, so in the early days and until the management team is built out, typically the company will have 100 employees by then. They'll have a well-entrenched CEO and then VP of marketing, engineering, operations. So once a bigger team of both staff and of uh, other investors are around, you kind of take a step back. Exactly, uh, including when the venture capital firm comes in, because the angel investors are the farm team for the, for the big VCs. Right. The scouts. Yeah, we're the scouts. So when the big VC comes in and the management team gets built out, we're not needed anymore. We go back to the front of the assembly line of startups right. and go meet two brand new entrepreneurs and bring them up to roughly 100 people. Well, and, and I, I, you know, I, you and I have known each other for a long time, and I, I, that post by Ben Horowitz and Emily made reference to really gave some insight into the ways that, however, that CEOs can reach to you, go back to you for the help that they need long into the existence of the company. It does seem like uh, your experiences really, your company seemed to get that out of you. 
Yes, uh, we, we help the CEO, because remember, these CEOs, Larry, Sergey, Mark Zuckerberg, Jack Dorsey, we know these CEOs when they have a team of five people. So over the years, these CEOs will come back and ask for advice. Well, you've built but it's not, it's not often. These, these are very, very capable people and we go give our advice to brand new CEOs. So here's my question. You know, these days, it takes a lot less to build a company, a lot less dollars to build a company. Because you can get started with, you know, using Amazon Web Services to, to host your development, using uh, Mechanical Turk, sticking with Amazon, or cloud sourcing to build the developing around the, the, the product, it seems like the necessity for those later rounds of venture capital isn't there anymore. Has that changed your business? Well, starting in the very beginning, I always encourage entrepreneurs to bootstrap the company. Don't take money from anybody for as long as you can, because then uh, there'll be less dilution. But when you do take money now for a startup, a million dollars is a big round, because all these and services used to be are there. Oh, oh, to start a company, uh, back in the in the in the uh, 1998 99, you needed 10 million dollars. You had to buy an Oracle database, a Sun server. Right. You, you needed five million just to build the infrastructure. All that's outsourced today. So a million dollars, you can find out if you have a good idea. So how has that changed the kinds of companies that you're looking at? Are you able to look at companies at an even earlier stage? I mean, you, you're. Like I said, you've always kind of been there when it's two guys, a garage, and a PowerPoint presentation. Yes, well, uh, the investments that we make in all the Y Combinator companies is a great example, uh, where these are teams of two or three engineers at the max, and they're at the very, very beginning where, where we can help them the most. That's our sweet spot. So what's the one thing that you hear from the most successful, the people who turn out to be the most successful entrepreneurs. When you're meeting with some kid who's you know, in t-shirts and flip-flops straight out of Stanford, or Cal, or somewhere. What's Harvard. The one, or Harvard, I've heard of that, but it's in uh, like Boston area, right? Right. So what's the one thing you hear from them? As far as what now? Like, what, are they, they're excited, are they smart, are they, do they have a solution, they're oh. personally involved. I hear all these different things from different venture capitalists. Oh, they, but you've had remarkable success finding the great inventors of our, our time. Yeah, the, these are usually inventors who are solving a problem that they have had themselves. Chad Hurley and Steve Chen uh, at YouTube, Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook. He just wanted to find an online version of the physical Facebook that right. existed at Harvard. Uh, so um, engineers... So involvement in that problem. Yeah, yeah. And, and an engineer who's a, also a product visionary. Right. When you look at the product visionaries of all time, the companies who have been the most successful, Google, Facebook, Twitter, right. Apple, is because they were led by product visionaries. There you have it. Uh, Ron Conway, SV Angel, really appreciate it. Uh, you know, the, we, the, you, they say you're the Silicon Valley godfather. You can see it when you walk these aisles. Emily?